welcome members and friends of St. John's Church to our service of worship on Sunday, December 6th, if you can believe it, if you look outside, such beautiful weather for December. But anyway, I trust that your day is going well and that you will rejoice as we worship together. I want to say thank you to Mike Norbaum. He's our technology guy at church, and he discovered that when I tried to do the Advent wreath, the microphone didn't pick me up very well, so Mike bought me a, a new microphone. So thank you, Mike, for doing that. Our call to worship this morning is taken from Isaiah chapter 41, verse 10, where we find these words, Fear not, for I am with you. Be not dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. I will help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. Fear not, my friends. That's God's message for those who belong to him during the Christmas season. Fear not. The Savior has come. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, thank you for the wonderful time of Christmas and not even the pandemic can rob us of the joy of celebrating the birth of the Savior. Bless our time together as we worship you today, for we ask it in the precious name of Jesus our Lord. Amen. One of the hymns I'd like to share with you today is Love Has Come. Love has come. A light in the darkness. Love explodes in the Bethlehem skies. See all heaven has come to proclaim it. Hear how their song of joy arises. Love, love, born unto you a Savior. Love, love, glory to God on high. Love has come. He will never leave us. Love is life everlasting and free. Love is Jesus within and among us. Love is the peace our hearts are seeking. Love, love. Love is the gift of Christmas. Love, love. Praise to you, God on high. Well, we're going to give our Advent wreath another try this week and see if we can not only see the Advent wreath, but hear the little message as well. Kids, I think all of you know that there's lots of preparation that's going on during Christmas. Well, you probably put up your Christmas tree. You're getting out the Christmas decorations. We've done that. You're putting up lights. You're doing all kinds of things to prepare for Christmas. But our Advent wreath reminds us that the most important kind of preparation is remembering what the Bible has to say about the Savior. Last week, we lit our first candle. And we'll see how that works. And that was the promise candle. Throughout the Bible, God gave all kinds of promises about sending his son to save his people. There are some 300 prophecies in the Old Testament that Jesus fulfilled in his coming. Well, today's candle will focus on faith. Well, it's not one thing for God to promise that he's going to send his son to be the savior but he sent his son to be the savior of those who believe. You probably know John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. So today, we're going to light the second candle, the candle of faith, or sometimes it's called the Bethlehem candle. Well, I should turn this so you can see it, right? I lit one candle. And I'm going to light another candle in a second. The faith candle or the Bethlehem candle. It's wonderful that the Savior came, but even more important that we would believe. Try this again. Let's see if that will stay. Christmas is a wonderful time, and there's all kinds of preparation that goes on to get ready for Christmas. 
and I would think that maybe even some of you would even hope there might be a present under the tree for you. Our message today comes from the book of Philippians, a book that isn't about Christmas as such, but there's one part about the book of Philippians that's very much about Christmas, and that's the humility of our Lord Jesus Christ. Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 through 11. Paul writes, in your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who being in the very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness and being found in in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord of the glory of God the Father. The announcement of the Savior's birth came to a lowly group of shepherds on a Judean hillside outside Bethlehem. And it's significant that these lowly shepherds became the first evangelists of the gospel of salvation, declaring that the great God of heaven humbled himself, taking upon himself the form of a servant to save a lost humanity from their sins. Now that's good news indeed. It's interesting that God would choose this lowly group of shepherds to make this glorious announce, announcement because shepherds were among the most common and lowly people of that day. Shepherds were even despised by the Orthodox Jews the most religious people of their day. Because the shepherds did not keep all the rules and regulations of the ceremonial law. They were too busy tending their flocks and protecting their flocks to observe all the hand washings and rules and regulations that characterized the religion of the Jews of that day. Here in Philippians chapter 2, we have a clue as to why God would choose to reveal the greatest news ever to a lowly and often despised group of shepherds. It was because the lowly nature and character of the Savior, who in his coming identified himself with the lowly and the despised of this world, he was a savior that most of us can identify with because we too see ourselves as ordinary and even lowly men and women in contrast to the great and powerful of this world. In verses 5 through 7, Paul calls us to identify with Christ in his humility. In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant being made in human likeness. The attitude Jesus displayed in his coming was one of humility and submission. When we think of someone who is the sovereign ruler of all things, we don't think of the qualities of humility and submission. The word sovereign would indicate that that person has to answer to no one, and he doesn't. And yet for our salvation, 
the sovereign God of heaven and earth chose to take upon himself human flesh and live among a simple, excuse me, and live among a sinful people, a simple and humble life that would end by being rejected by those he came to save and being crucified like a common criminal in order to save those who would come to him with the simple faith of a child. The human mind could not even imagine such an act of humiliation by the creator of the universe, and yet that's exactly what he chose to do with the coming of the Savior. Jesus' earthly life was truly simple and humble. When his disciples talked about following him, Jesus said, Foxes have holes and birds of the air have their nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. Jesus had few, if any, earthly possessions except for his robe, which his crucifiers cast lots for as they waited for him to die. Paul tells us that he made himself nothing. He stripped himself of his divine rights and privileges as God to bring about the salvation of those who were living in rebellion against him. That includes us. In the course of his earthly life, Jesus chose to associate with the least of these, the often despised and outcast of this world. And by doing so, was despised and rejected by the religious and the powerful of his day for our benefit. In doing so, Jesus fulfilled the words of Isaiah's prophecy in chapter 53. He was despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows, and acquainted with grief. And we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised, and we esteemed him not. He made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant being made in human likeness. Jesus made himself nothing, identifying himself with sinners and the outcasts of societies, of society, taking upon himself the very nature of a servant being made in human likeness, one who was truly God and fully man. No wonder the circumstances surrounding his birth were so meager and unassuming. Being born in a stable, far from home, worshiped by a bunch of nobodies by the world standards, a group of shepherds who had been keeping watch over their sheep on a nearby hillside outside Bethlehem, to whom the angel appeared and announced to them the greatest news ever proclaimed. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. The Savior born was Christ the Lord of heaven and earth, who stooped low to bring salvation to us who caused him shame. And therefore, the same commitment to humility and submission should be reflected in the lives of those of us who confess him as Lord and Savior. Verse 5, in your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ. Jesus. Jesus himself set the standard for his disciples by the life he lived. For example, 
we have this exchange between Jesus and his disciples in Mark chapter 10. Jesus called them together and said, You know that those who are regarded as rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their high officials exercise authority over them. Not so with you. Instead, whoever wants to be great among you must be your servant. And whoever wants to be first must be slave of all. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. In verse 8, Paul calls us to identify with Christ in his obedience. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Just as the disobedience of Adam was the downfall of the entire human race, it would be the obedience of God's own Son made man that would be the source of redemption and restoration of all who believe in him. Salvation of a sinful humanity could only be provided by the perfect obedience and the perfect sacrifice of one who is without sin. We find these words in 1 Peter chapter 1. For you know that it was not with perishable things such as silver or gold that you were redeemed, but with the precious blood of Christ, a lamb without blemish, blemish or defect. He was chosen before the creation of the world, but was revealed in these last times for your sake. And it was the perfect obedience that the eternal Son of God was willing to offer up on our behalf. As we read in Hebrews chapter 10. Therefore, when Christ came into the world, he said, Sacrifice and offering you did not desire, but a body you prepared for me. Talking about his human body, the body of his incarnation. With burnt offerings and sin offerings, you were not pleased. Then I said, here I am. It is written about me in the scroll. I have come to do your will, O oh my God. For me, one of the most moving pictures in all of Scripture is Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane pleading with his heavenly Father to spare him from the agony of the suffering that awaited him on the cross. This is taken from Luke chapter 22. Jesus went out as usual to the Mount of Olives and his disciples followed him. He withdrew about a stone's throw beyond them, knelt down and prayed, Father, if you are willing, take this cup from me, yet not my will, but yours be done. And being in anguish, he prayed more earnestly, and his sweat was like drops of blood falling to the ground. My friends, the Savior's suffering was real. Even the prospect of the suffering he would endure on the cross was almost unbearable for the Son of God to bear. But for our sakes, 
he became obedient unto death, even death, on a cross. And as his followers, Jesus calls us to a radical level of obedience as well. In Luke 9, 23, Jesus had this to say. If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself. Take up his cross daily and follow me. To me, taking up my cross on a daily basis means being obedient to God regardless of the price. It means saying no to the sinful desires that seek to dominate my life and instead saying yes to the things that please the Savior and bring honor and glory to him. Such things as serving others, loving and forgiving others, making allowances for the shortcomings of others, just as he has made allowances for me because of his love. In verses 9 through 11, Paul calls us to identify with Christ in his exaltation. Therefore, God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father, beginning with me. When Christ had finished his work, of taking upon himself our flesh and blood, humbling himself and becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross, God exalted him in the most glorious way imaginable. Defying the natural law of death, he raised our Lord Jesus Christ from the grave victorious over sin and death and the devil on behalf of all who believe. And then he ascended back into heaven and was given the name that is above every name. We don't know what that name was, but we can glean something of the magnitude of that name and that accomplishment by looking at several cross references to these verses in Philippians. One is from Isaiah chapter 53, verse 12. Therefore, I will give him, referring to Christ, a portion among the great. And he will divide the spoils with the strong because he poured out his life unto death and was numbered with the transgressors. For he bore the sin of many and made intercession for the transgressors. And by the way, Jesus continues to make intercession before the throne of God for men and women like us who believe, even today. Another cross-references cross is to Daniel chapter 7, verse 14. And there was given to him dominion and glory and a kingdom that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away, and his kingdom that shall not be destroyed. Or maybe we should just leave it at the glorious words that were given to the Apostle Paul. Therefore, God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name. 
that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. My friends, the wonder and the beauty of Christmas can only be understood in light of his coming and humble obedience to redeem those who believe. That we might not only identify with him in his humiliation and his obedience, but also in his exaltation. A glorious message indeed. And all I can say about it is, hallelujah, what a Savior. What a Savior. Join with me as we recite the Lord's Prayer. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Uh, <clears throat> one of my favorite hymns is entitled, Thou Didst Leave Thy Throne. Thou didst leave thy throne and thy kingly crown when thou camest to earth for me. But in Bethlehem's home was found no room for thy holy nativity. Oh, come to my heart, Lord Jesus. There is room in my heart for thee. Heaven's arches rang when the angels sang, proclaiming thy royal degree. But of lowly birth didst thou come to earth and in great humility. The foxes found rest and the birds their nest in the shade of the forest tree. By thy couch, but thy couch was the sod, O thou son of God, in the deserts of Galilee. Thou camest, O Lord, with the living word that should set thy people free. But with mocking scorn and with crown of thorn, they bore thee to Calvary. When the heavens shall ring and her choirs shall sing at thy coming to victory, let thy voice call me home, saying, yet there is room, there is room at my side for thee my heart shall rejoice Lord Jesus when thou comest and callest for me now may the grace mercy and peace of God the Father God the Son and God the Holy Spirit rest upon your life this day and forevermore. Amen. I look forward to seeing you again on Wednesday for our study in the book of Psalms. And also just a reminder, our Sunday school teachers have been doing, doing a great job putting together a virtual Sunday School Christmas program and that will be live streamed for you on our church's web website and also our, our church's Facebook page. You'll enjoy it very much, December 20th. And then we will have a live streamed Christmas Eve service from the church. 
but it will be hard because it's just going to be Mike and Mary Hubert and me. But it will be live streamed from St. John's Church in the countryside between Hutchinson and Glencoe. I look forward to that very much. See you on Wednesday. Thank you.